This is a short version of a talk I gave at EAG in May 2016 at a workshop on open source geoscience software. I wanted to talk about strategies for a revolution um, and that's to say a, a big change in how uh, how our community ex sort of accepts, uses, uh, builds open source software and also open content, open data and so on. So these are the things I wanted to touch on. Um, I'll let you pause the video and read them if you want to sort of see them all in advance, but I'm going to talk about all of them over the next few minutes. Um, now I started off with open all the things, <laughs> but I'm really just talking about these four things. Code, that's to say software, data, so seismic files, well logs, production data, that kind of thing. Content, by which I mean sort of documents, images, text and so on and culture which is a bit of a woolly thing maybe but I'm sort of getting at the um, you know the environment for all this other stuff to happen and the point here really is just that all these things have to happen um, but they don't all have to happen at the same time or at the same speed some of them are definitely easier to do than others some of them are further along than others um, but I think we need to recognize that we can't just focus on uh, open source software we have to also think about things like open data so I really applaud efforts like the open seismic repository um, that the uh, open detect uh, DGB earth sciences guys have uh, have pulled off um, open content is also really important for promoting all these things so I applaud things like um, the SEG putting the uh, SEG wiki out there under an open license and all of these things are really about um, you know changing the sort of mindset of our industry if we're going to better serve each other as professionals and also better serve society in general um, I think this adoption of an open culture will uh, essentially get out of the way of sharing collaboration and uh, all those things that lead to faster deeper innovation right that's what it's really all about is getting new ideas out into people's hands faster now, it turns out that organizations like the SEG have actually thought about this. Um, the ethical guide guidelines for authors, for example, point number two in there is uh, is this uh, written here. And it's, it's basically saying that papers should be reproducible, um, which really means that they're going to have to have open uh, code. So the code has to be published along with the paper and open data so that you can actually reproduce the experiment that's been done, uh, been written about in, in the article. And, you know, I think it's safe to say that this guideline is sort of roundly ignored by uh, editors and authors alike. And, you know, we really can't or shouldn't uh, or don't have to leave it to SEG to sort of implement this guideline. We as a community, as authors, as scientists can actually just um, start sort of living up to, if you like, this aspiration that I think was written into the guidelines uh, several years ago. So, you know, let's essentially take them at their word and and think about this um, when we write new papers and so on. Think about, oh, where am I going to put my data? Where am I going to put the code so that people can reproduce my paper? Now, I just mentioned SEG Wiki. It's an awesome experiment SEG has been uh, doing for several years now. And it's basically a sort of Wikipedia-like website and all of it's open access. So they've put out... Um, the uh, Sheriff Dictionary and Yilmaz's uh, book on uh, seismic analysis um, are on there as completely open content so you're free to use them and share them and you know use them for whatever purpose so it's a, a really bold step by SEG and we actually there are similar things uh, wikis that is from AEPG and SPE we need to see more experiments like this in our um, business now that open data page gets at some of the uh, open seismic data that's out there. Carl Schleicher has done an amazing and basically single-handed job of gathering all of those data sources. Um, so do check it out if you're into open data. But the point I wanted to make about that was it's a bit of a skunk works kind of a project, which is a fantastic way to sort of do the experiment and um, get started. But it, if we're going to have a sort of sustainable landscape of open data, we're going to need um, 
to throw a little bit more at it. Uh, so I'd put this openweathermap.org site up here as a sort of example. And there are hundreds of examples like this. It doesn't have to be, um, you know, <laughs> this, this one isn't perhaps particularly relevant. Um, but the, the difference is that there's this very consistent, deep documentation around everything. Um, you can subscribe to things like RSS feeds uh, and make sure that you've got the latest data at all times. And critically, it's machine readable. So these little API doc buttons, um, you can get the documentation to the API that gives you programmatic access to the data. Well, what does that mean? It means that you can pull down data like this uh, here, which is JSON. So this is a, uh, a pretty standard data exchange format for the internet, very easily passed into Python code or uh, JavaScript code. Um, and as you can see, it's sort of self-documenting insofar as the labels are fairly clear. Um, you know, there's a temperature, minimum, maximum, pressure, sea level, everything's labeled. Um, and this essentially transforms our ability as programmers um, to consume data sources and build awesome things, right? I mean, that's what it's all about, is building useful and interesting tools uh, on top of these data sets. And if we're constantly having to kind of download gigantic files and uh, figure out their formats and headers and so on, um, that's just sort of in the way. So this is a great example of a place where code and data need to be opened and uh, optimized, if you like, in tandem. Now another really interesting content or open content experiment from SEG is the geophysical tutorials which started uh, a few years ago now and uh, I coordinate this column it's been really successful and actually last year and actually I think to this day um, many of the top kind of 10 or 20 most downloaded articles in the leading edge are these um, open access tutorials on geophysics as, as you can see here this was the top four when I gave this talk in May 2016 uh, all open access tutorials so uh, I think that just speaks to how um, getting out of the way of putting knowledge into people's hands uh, is actually really effective people are hungry for this stuff and it, it, it open access works the power of the stack so <laughs> Um, moving on uh, from the sort of open all the things point, I wanted to talk about stacks. And I'm not talking about seismic stacks here, I'm talking about software stacks. So what's a software stack? Well, here's the scientific Python stack with Python at its core and then some kind of uh, critical libraries like NumPy that does um, uh, array math, Cython, Jupyter. Um, in the sort of next layer and then further out higher level libraries like scipy and matplotlib for plotting and pandas for data wrangling um, and then further out still more kind of specialized libraries and actually this particular vision of the stack from jake van der plas at scipy in 2015 is really getting at the astronomy community but when i saw this it made me wonder wow what is what does the geophysics stack look like um could we even describe it well, it turns out that there are actually dozens, uh, over 40 open source geophysics packages out there. And these are just ones that I know about. They're in the uh, wiki, uh, the Wikipedia page, Comparison of Free Geophysics Software. Um, there are further 13 that are more like geological software. Uh, actually, there is a bit of overlap, I think, between those two uh, lists. But the beginnings of a stack are there this is all open source so you can like read the code change it share it uh, use it for any purpose the beginnings of a stack are there but if we're going to really grow it and really make use of it and grow awareness of it and contributors to those stacks um, or to those projects we need to see more skills out there in our community because you know the level of code literacy is I would say relatively low, especially among geologists, uh, also among the broader geophysical community. Um, and what can we do to grow that? Well, there's all sorts of things we can do. Uh, at the time I gave this talk uh, last year, we'd actually just run a hackathon in Vienna. Um, this 
photo here was from that hackathon. This is a team from University of Leeds and uh, one student from the University of Copenhagen. They built a Tetris clone that also did basin modeling. If that sounds crazy, then look up Traptris um, <laughs> on on the internet or maybe on agilescientific.com and, uh, and read about it. But um, you know, so hackathons are one sort of modality, if you like, for for finding new skills. But we need to we need more courses, we need more tutorials, we need um, more materials for people to to learn from. Now, conferences are a great opportunity. At the, this is these are photos from SciPy. At the top here is a picture from the tutorials. There are two days of tutorials at SciPy, which are basically courses, sort of half a day or one day long courses. But it's very much hands-on. So it's not all just people writing notes. It's laptops open, open code, open data, um, high level of energy in the room, people asking lots of questions, sharing with each other, helping each other. They're fantastic. I'd love to see more of that in geoscience conferences. And at the bottom here is a picture from also from SciPy from one of the sprints, where again, as part of the conference, so exploiting this sort of infrastructure of the conference, you know, coffee and the, the space. Uh, and the registration process and everything. Uh, people are getting together and actually building these stacks, contributing to them real code in real time with each other, uh, building awesome relationships like human relationships um, that happen to be highly productive because they come away from the weekend with um, some new functionality in their software. Uh, help, as you can see, very, lots of collaboration and uh, sort of self-help. We need more of that. Classrooms, awesome, but insufficient on their own, right? Uh, it tends to be our fallback for sort of, oh, we need more skills, let's run courses. And courses like Software Carpentry in the academic environment are fantastic. Um, uh, we need to exploit the stuff that's already out there for sure. Um, but like I say, not enough on their own. In the same way that, um, Networking events aren't enough on their own, especially if they're really just social events. You know, to me, that's sort of not networking. It's socializing. Uh, the um, when the f the sort of friction, if you like, is that low, n nothing really sticks, right? So the tends to be fairly superficial conversation about you know vacations and so on. Uh, I think that to get people really connected and really networking we need to have them working together on projects that they care about um, that's what builds trust that's what as we've just seen builds skills um, so let's explore some new ways of networking too at our conferences and I, I'm, I'm certain that there's room in conferences to fit these in alongside the lectures essentially which is what conferences tend to be built from at SEG there are over a thousand of them in the week and I, I just feel like surely we can take some of that program and um, recognize that lectures are necessary, but that they are insufficient for building skills, for building community, for building networks and so on. Like we need to do more. So, you know, there's only three people in this picture, but they're thinking hard about a problem together. This is a picture from the hackathon, one of the other uh, teams. Here's another one, and what, what I found interesting about these chaps was um, the chap on the left there lives in Spain. He had never met these other two before. They're from Brazil. They know each other really well, but they'd never worked together on a project, right? So at the hackathon, they, it was the first time, although, although they were already friends, that they got to contribute to um, a piece of work together. So that built a new sort of dimension to their friendship, and they'll, I hope, continue to collaborate. And of course, they're social events too. So there's plenty of opportunity for socializing and meeting new people at, uh, at things like hackathons. Um, but again, it's a, I've got that kernel of kind of common purpose at the heart of it. So I, I, I feel like it's a, the level of networking is deeper than it is a sort of, uh, you know, just standing around drinking terrible coffee in the, the hurried break uh, between lectures. Okay, so funding, you know, a lot. I mean, open source software is is free, <laughs> but in order to be free, uh, the, the money comes into the equation. Uh, we need to pay for people's time. We need to pay for resources. We need to pay for things like training. And the UK government last year conducted a really interesting experiment um, 
the Oil and Gas Authority uh, put together a huge data package of open data uh, shown here on, on this map of well data mm -hmm. as well as seismic data and um, and put it out there and asked for proposals essentially for sort of R&D type um, projects or proposals for new products that people could build around these data sets and there was real money tens and tens of thousands of pounds uh, on the table for projects that could um, pitch something something awesome so I thought that was a really nice uh, bit of outreach essentially to try and bring some new players into the consulting or data product market um, with some real money and real data uh, all of which is open by the way uh, including like field data so this is a really great uh, um, data set and at the same time there was a similar um, the OGA uh, sorry the CDA did a um, similar kind of uh, what would you call it collaboration on uh, an unstructured data set also from the UK continental shelf um, and I believe that concluded last November November 2016 but this creative approach got a lot of attention got a lot of press and so on and uh, I think it was a lot of fun for the people that took part in it so let's see governments and uh, dare I say even corporations academic institutions and technical societies thinking a little bit outside the box and thinking about how, you know how can we engage the community um, in some to, and provoke them into innovation now money also helps uh, build software the Python stack has grown substantially recently and become a lot more robust through the efforts of a, a charitable foundation called NumFocus which essentially just tries to sort of centralize the fundraising um, aspect so that these relatively small software projects on their own aren't going around sort of asking for five or ten thousand dollars here and there but the entire organization can go to big companies you know Microsoft big banks um, Google and so on and ask for substantial amounts of money over several years it's much more sustainable um, and then they sort of oversee the disbursement of this to the to the smaller projects helping them work together looking for synergies and um, looking for ways to sort of grow the ecosystems as as one as it were and i would love to see something like that in geoscience um, last year i imagined a, a non-existent organization called the open geoscience foundation uh, it, it like i say it doesn't exist but i think it should if you're interested in exploring that idea with me please get in touch you can go to open.geoscience.foundation on the web uh, there's a button there to email me or just drop me a line at matt at agilescientific.com I'd love to talk to you about how we can make some of that good stuff happen uh, in subsurface science and that's all I had for you um, like I say please please get in touch if you're interested in exploring any of the, these ideas uh, if not um, look out for me in person at one of these conferences I'm going to EAGE again in 2017 and also to SEG. I'll also be at the Canada Geo Convention in 2017 and I'm very easy to find online. Um, I'm on Twitter, GitHub, all those places. Uh, visit me agilescientific.com and you can look for me there and all those other places and hope you enjoyed this short talk. Thanks very much for listening and goodbye.